And he's spending a hopefully very productive week with us, looking at his schedule, he is he's extremely busy. So Roger is a professor at Stanford University. He obtained his PhD at Cambridge University, where he was supervised by Martin Reed. He then has postdoctoral for positions at Cambridge, Princeton, and Berkeley, after which he joined the Caltech faculty. <coughs> Later on, he moved to his current uh, university, Stanford. And here at Stanford, Became, he became the first director of the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. <coughs> Over his career, Roger has received many, many awards, okay, and I should just highlight a few, such as the Crowfoot Prize, the Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Humboldt Prize, Eddington Medal, the Danny Heinemann Prize for Astrophysics, Helen B. Warner Prize for Astronomy. Okay. In addition, I should also mention that Roger is a fellow of the Royal Society, Royal Society member of the U.S. National Academy of, Academy of Science, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, and fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, after all this introduction, I should also tell, tell you what he's doing, but in terms of research, but I think you all very well know his research. But in general terms, he's uh, interested in many aspects of particle astrophysics and cosmology, for example, gravitational lensing, Compact objects such as black holes, neutron stars, and white holes, and cosmic rays. Okay. Today, he's going to tell us about something exciting, and uh, well, which may raise some questions since some of you are lost thought. So, he will tell us about black hole ergomagnetospheres, electromagnetic jets, and ejection disks. So, yeah, it goes. <coughs> well, uh, Thank you very much indeed, Akash, and thank you, uh, Charles, and everybody else who invited me to, to return to CFA, where I spent a very, very happy sabbatical in 1890, uh, and um, also uh, have been back, obviously, many other times. But I'm especially touched to be the um, Steve Murray uh, lecturer, uh, because although I don't have as close interaction with Steve, as most of you, will have, most of the older ones here, will have had, um, who was a, you know, a giant of high-energy astrophysics and a, a pillar of, of the Center for Astrophysics, working in many different roles here and on many different missions, as you know all too well. We were also uh, close collaborators, mainly through the high-energy astrophysics division of the American Astronomical Society. And I, I guess I work most closely with Steve in that in that role, and he was tireless and extremely wise. Um, I got to know him and uh, certainly enjoyed working with him and learned a lot from him. So uh, I'm, I'm very touched to be giving this talk in his memory. And without taking away from any of what I've just said, I would also like to just acknowledge somebody uh, who all passed away about the same year. Sorry, I had a picture there of Steve, so I should say that, yes. Um, and uh, I'd also like to acknowledge somebody who passed away the same year, was Dan, I think it was about the same time, was Dan Harris, who, whose scientific uh, contributions are uh, sort of front and center in some sense in the story I'm going to tell. And every time I look at M87 Jet, I sort of unconsciously can't stop myself thinking of Dan, who was, uh, who was uh, also a wonderful person. And um, so... Um, what I'm actually going to do here is something that I, uh, that's sort of quite bold. I mean, I guess this is my uh, title um, slide, and there's a list of people here. Um, I should probably add more to them. I would say um, all of them have contributed considerably, and I've mainly, mainly been people I've been talking with most recently, um, to my general views on the topics I'm going to discuss and none of whom I think would sign up to all of this. So anything good should be credited to them, and, any, and, and in some of them their contributions are don't do it. Um, but, uh, uh, the, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but all of them have uh, certainly contributed to my own thinking on this matter without being in implicated in it. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to take, this is partly sort of stimulated, 
or encouraged, although I've been thinking about these things for much longer, by the spectacular image of the Event Horizon Telescope. And uh, I, I was, you, you know, obviously I knew this was coming. It was in anticipation for a very long time. But when I actually saw it, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't sort of say, well, that was unexpected. It was a, it was a wonderful thing. And I would like to just say, start off by making public tribute to, uh, to all that went into that, uh, creating that image, and, and, the, and obviously a huge amount of organization of radio astronomical e expertise, uh, building re receivers, um, uh, getting this huge collaboration to actually function as a collaboration, a, a massive job nowadays, uh, a computation, and especially is from where I stand, you know, the, the heroic effort that went into the simulations and the interpretation of the image. So all of this was a, a fantastic thing, but again, seeing Owen Shapiro sitting in, in the back of the hall, uh, do not forget that this rests on the shoulders of radio astronomical giants who... Um, pioneered the technique of very long baseline interferometry starting in the 1960s and it's just grown year after year after year and I've just come from the meeting in Charlottesville yesterday on space VOBI where there are great plans to launch uh, uh, an unspecified number uh, of telescopes operating an unspecified number of wavelengths uh, into un unspecified positions in space. And, uh, and it's extremely exciting because th this prospect has been there for, you know, for 30 or 40 years of doing space VOBI and has happened with at least three missions. But to do it big time with a, with a very much more ambitious facility has certainly existed there. And, you know, we know it can be done. Uh, and, but, it, uh, but the EHD itself has, has, has uh, given a great boost to this uh, activity. So there's a lot of excitement down there on this, too. So it's, this, is, this, is, this is a sort of a very exciting time, not just for me personally, but I think for everyone working in astronomy. So, uh, so I, I want to just start with those prefatory remarks and then uh, get back to um, uh, my more apologetic ones. Um, so if, as I think about... What, I, what I'm going to try and uh, discuss here, um, one way, one sort of metaphor for doing this is as a sort of a set of hot air balloons. Um, they're sort of, sort of ideas that float uh, for a while. And the one thing you know about ballooning is that it always comes back to Earth. Sometimes there's a gentle landing, sometimes less so. Uh, but, um, and sometimes the less so is involved in the metaphor in, in in observation, but that's what happens. So I'm going to try out, and I may not get to the end of this list, a series of, um, of ideas here, which are sort of out of the mainstream, by, I think, um, although I may find out otherwise. Um, and so there is a sort of view, it's mainly stimulated, obviously, by observations of active galactic nuclei, and most people here know quite a lot about that, and um, so what I'm going to say, I think, has the, um, the character of heresy, and this is a rather a poignant uh, image to show this week, uh, but, um, uh, but, you know, it, it's sort of, uh, I think it's sort of heresy in a little bit, in the sense of some of the, things I'm get, the ideas I'm going to try out on you, uh, but also, um, uh, thinking about this, I was just thinking about this, if I take you out of the business and just think about unsuspecting protons um, in accretion disks and think about what happened from the Spanish Inquisition becoming uh, the Reformation and why it became such, um, I'm going to try and help them. If they give money, then I will uh, save them from time in purgatory and what lies beyond. Um, so... Uh, um, so that's a, another metaphor. Um, so, um, and uh, so I like to think of it in the heresy. But there's a third way of thinking about this, which I'm particularly conscious of. And I can say, and all the young, eager, highly cap capable simulators here in the audience, like Ramesh Narayan, um, and uh, would, 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 could, would, we can't say is that it's this. Um, so at any rate, so you can take it, uh, take any of these three reactions and you can leave now. Now you've got the preview, you can leave. Okay, all right. So I'm not going to give the sort of popular preamble here because uh, people here do know the sort of jargon and so on and observations of, of active galactic nuclei and all of that. I'll just make, say a few sort of very simple things. Of course, these are jets. 
that are seen in ra originally in radio, but now very much in X-ray. There's picture A and so on, spectacular thing. I mean, you just have to be stunned. How does nature do this with all the instabilities known to man and plasma physicists are manifesting these objects? And how does nature do that? Um, you know, do these great tricks and we try so hard and to do to control things like this and it never works. Uh, so, um, so, you know, there's all these things. They're lovely. And every one of these has a mother uh, that, that, that loves it. And, um, and the key thing is it's not just these extragalactic sources. They're everywhere. Um, here, Jim Connor allows me to show this. This is the meerkat deep field sort of thing. There's a billion so radio sources out there. You can count them on the sky. Over a billion, I think, now. And half of them are jets, almost certainly. And the other half are probably mostly starburst galaxies and so on. Crab Nebula's got a jet. Here's protostars, they've got them all over the place, SS-43, galactic objects. Here's uh, 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 an otherwise undistinguished BL lack objects, which may be the first identified neutrino source. I'm barely going to go there, but it's terribly, the whole business is terribly important, depending on the credibility, not, not hinging on the credibility of this particular identification. And then here's, a, here's um, uh, the gravitational wave 170017, uh, the neutron star merger, which, um, you know, produced, uh, uh, you, you know, all the spectacular follow-up from the gravitational wave event and you know, the identification with Fermi, you know, X-ray astronomy and the gamma-ray astronomy was central to this. And, uh, and then, uh, then the radio astronomers were left out in the cold, what used to do is radio astronomy. Um, but they, it is lovely astronomy story. Of course, they didn't give up. And then uh, everyone, all the simulators were saying, well, not all of them, but some of them were saying, oh, there won't be any jet, there shouldn't be any jet, and so on. So what do they find? They find eventually, after about a couple of months, there's a jet, and it went on forever and ever, and it completely transformed people's views of what is going on in this, this object, and by extension, short, short gamma ray burst. So again, jets everywhere, that's the point. So here's one in particular. Here's, I'm going to come back to this image again. Here's Perseus A. Um, as it was then called, uh, PC84 to some of you, or NC1275 to others. And this is the radio astron image. You can see here like this. And this is sort of on the scale, uh, uh, on the scale of 300 black hole radii or so on. This was, you know, the, again, one seeing these jets come from closer and closer to the black hole. And so, this, so I'm really interested, perhaps, in why the, how those jets happened. And there's a black hole, and here's the lighting. Thing to notice here, and it's been a pattern for a very long time. It's clear to, is that the emission from the jets is coming from the edges. It's a boundary layer or whatever. It's not coming from the. They're not center filled. They're but they're like like a one-dimensional supernova remnant. You see the emission from the edges, and there's I think very good reasons for that. But the other thing is that this does seem to emanate from a, a rate. I'll come back to this point from a radius larger than the size of the black hole. Okay, so, um, and I think it's on radiation and so on. And then the other thing that will be part of this story is, here's, this is not actually a, a, something left over from Halloween. It is uh, the X-ray image of the, of the Perseus cluster, which has got gas uh, cooling and, to some extent, falling into the nucleus, not two eyes and a mouth and so on. But these are all bubbles, of course. Here are the radio sources. The Perseus cluster is kept warm and cozy by... Um, uh, being inflated by activity in the nucleus of the galaxy. Obviously, there's a bit of energy released from the infalling gas, but what's really keeping it, keeping it hot is the, is the nucleus. And you could debate the mechanisms involved, and you should do, because they're not, it's not a, a, a full story. But, um, but nonetheless, volumetrically, what's going on right in the center, this tiny thing smaller than the solar system, is keeping the mighty Perseus cluster hot. Okay. Um, so here's M87. You might have seen this before. I don't know. Um, but uh, and I'll show you times. Um, so it's the. I, I, I'll use this as an example. But there's, you know, there's more. This isn't just a one special object. This is typical, uh, but well observed because for reasons you understand. So it's a, a galaxy, it's a six billion solar mass black hole, and so on. It's got the prominent jets and so on. Here's a montage, actually a radio montage. But uh, the X-rays and gamma rays and so on are part of the story too, and we can see as we go down to smaller and smaller scales, we can see uh, wonderful observations here from Craig Wheeler and others. Again, the edge brightening and seeing down to smaller and smaller scales, and then this ring-like structure that was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope. And you know that story extremely well. I'm not going to recount it for you. Uh, the whole team uh, does immense credit for all of this. And I'm just going to leave it like that. Now, 
So I'm, gonna, I'm now going to sort of segue into a little bit of the astrophysics and some of the physics. And I've worked at trying to make this uh, quick. Um, well, it's clear it remains to be seen, but uh, at least I've tried to make it quick because there's a lot of things to store threads in some sense to bring together in this story. So the first thing is if we look at these jets as terribly important objects as I try to persuade you they are, are they made, now, you know, in the past you could invent all sorts of reasons for making them, including stuff coming out from other universes, but, um, but now it's a question, is, are they a disk or are they a black hole? And I'm going to argue for the second. I'm going to argue that essentially these jets, most of them, you know, the ones in AGN, are essentially powered by the spin of the central black hole. So if we don't get an 87, then roughly speaking, uh, and there's probably an order of magnitude both ways in terms of the average jet power, is about 10 to the 36 watts or 10 to the minus 5 Eddington, lumin Edding Eddington luminosity, if you like. It's way below critical mass creation. It's a highly starved, relative to its mass, it's starved of gas, like our galactic center, for which the Lord be praised. So uh, the millimeter observations, here's the whole spectrum here, um, is about, uh, you can argue the details here, the numbers there, but it's about... Uh, let, uh, two, order, two or three orders of magnitude smaller than whatever's associated with this. So it's, these things, it has been known for a very long time the jets, whatever made them, was, were much more powerful than the bolometric power of many of the sources associated with them. This is M87, not a mighty quasar. This is M87, this is a, a terribly faint, or whatever it is, object. Uh, in its prime, I have this on good authority, it was brighter than Vega. If it was growing as a, as a quasar at some time in the past, you would have seen, it would have been a, a big, you know, you'd have been navigating by it. So, um, so you know, this is, it. but now it's a terrible, uh, the feeble um, relic of, of its past glory. Hope things happen. Okay, so now the thing that's surprising about all of this is that disks are immensely dissipative structures. They're, naturally, they're differentially rotating. Even if you once thought that pockets of gas would orbit forever in, a, in Keplerian orbits around a central gravitating mass, you no longer should believe this because we know and have good evidence for instability, which the, the fastest, at least initially, is the magnetorotational instability, which happens on a dynamical time scale, which makes little bits of magnetic field and grows it to enormous magnetic stresses. And that seems unavoidable. In fact, the magnetorotational instability, you can argue, is irrelevant because it's a victim of its own success. It's got to evolve into something that's essentially a magnetic stress in any of these disks that's going to make them not only transport angular momentum, but be highly dissipative. They ought to radiate. And you have to have good reasons why they're invisible, because that's the claim here if you think that they, they're responsible for all of this power. Now, the black holes themselves, there's a lot of energy. In the, in the spin of a black hole. In the case of M87, you can say roughly it's about enough to keep the Virgo cluster cozy for about 10 to the 14 years. So there's a huge reservoir of energy there. And so the exercise is really to know how to tap it. And, uh, and uh, is that dissipative? Yes, it's even more, probably even more dissipative than the disks. But unlike with the disks, um, uh, the, uh, it, it, it's all terribly polite. Um, in the disks, you see all the dissipation on the front page of the newspaper. You sort of see it right in front of you. It comes to you. The dissipation that happens in a black hole all happens behind the event horizon. The curtains are closed. And so it's a very different story there. So there is dissipation there. There is growth of the mass of the black hole as a result of this dissipation. Now, I would, you know, like many people, I would say if I just take a very simple view of the jet in M87, then if you believe on the grounds that it's much better to power these jets by the spin of the hole where you don't have to see them, like black holes after all, uh, uh, rather than the disks, then, then that requires a field at the horizon of the black hole, about a kilogauss, 0.1 tesla or so on, just looked at naively. Now, so let's move on. So I'm going to claim, on the basis of this rather, w not terribly strong argument, but I think it's getting stronger with the observations, that the jet is powered by a spinning black hole, not a disk. Are all jets powered this way? No, almost certainly not. There are other types of jets in other environments, but things like M87 and so on, I'm going to claim that it is. Now I'm going to sort of segue into some physics, and I'll try to make this 
excessive because I just want to bring up some points without too much formalism and so on. Um, and um, the, uh, the idea is if you've got magnetic field and the magnetic flux threads the event horizon of a black hole, which I'm going to assume is described by the Kerr metric. I'm a simple-minded person, and I believe uh, what eminent New Zealanders tell me, uh, and there's more to it than that, but I really do believe in the Kerr metric, and the bon o onus of proof is really on those who will look, um, look for, who, who will claim other things, as many particle physicists have believe crazy things about horizons and so on, but uh, I think you know, the simple rel general relativistic description of the black hole by a Kerr metric is really the right way to go, and, you know, and, and that doesn't, doesn't mean it isn't worthwhile looking at alternatives, just like you do with general relativity itself, and set limits on alternatives as a, as a very fine exercise, which the Event Horizon Telescope is on the thresh, is it's doing, and it will do much more of this sort of thing, of being able to test Alternatives, that's a very important and scientific thing to do. But, you know, the smart money is on the curve metric being all it is. That's what I would say. Okay, so, um, similar statements can be made in cosmology. Uh, so, uh, so, there's two frames of reference that are classes of frames of reference, if you like, that are important. One is the sort of boyle linquist one, which is the one that's not rotating with respect to the distant stars and infinity and so on. Just call this the boyle linquist frame. And then the other one is a sort of local frame with an orthonormal basis that you can um, uh, assemble at every point in this space-time, and it's one that rotates with the black hole, a constant radius and constant uh, latitude, and, uh, and what you know is if that's going to be a physical, and we're thinking about a physical frame, that's one that has to rotate close enough to the black hole. And it's called ZAMO or zero angular momentum. It's got other names, but that'll, that'll work for these purposes. And so you have this second set of frames that rotate with the black hole, and uh, the ZAMO is one special one, and it's essentially the average of the minimum and maximum angular velocity that you can have with respect to the, the distant stars. So that's what characterizes that frame. Now, the way in which I and others prosecute this science is importantly different from the sort of simulations that uh, the Event Horizon Telescope and many others, including actually me wearing another hat, um, uh, have participated in. Uh, and those are done, done with relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. And there the presumption is that you're doing hydrodynamics with a fluid with a velocity at a given point, fluid velocity, a pressure, a density, and so on, and then some magnetic field that, that will be carried along with it. And it's that fluid velocity and the inertia that comes along with it that is terribly important. This is an important approach that um, is necessary for when you've got a large amount of gas around. But I'm going to claim, partly for reasons of simplicity, but also I think technically it, it, it's, it's, it's the right way forward, is in these environments the, uh, the inertia is unimportant. You've got much bigger problems. You can drop the inertia. So what that means is, in relativity language, the divergence of the magnet electromagnetic stress energy tensor vanishes, or equivalently in, in Maxwellian language, rho E plus J cross B vanishes. You can actually find this in Maxwell's book if you want. Go and look at this sort of thing. It's actually developed there, curiously enough. Um, so rho E plus J cross B vanishes, and this is called the relativistic force-free approximation. It's a and it's a called pure, completely causal theory, and you can use this for investigating these environment, so you ignore inertia. So under these rules, and if you assume that it's stationary and axisymmetric, I'm, going to, you know, I'm just going to say, you know, this is the spherical cow or whatever, this is something that's very, very simple, just keep it a stationary and axisymmetric, then, then what you're going to get is magnetic surfaces that penetrate the black hole, as shown in that cartoon, um, and these magnetic surfaces, we'll call them flux surfaces if you like, they just contain a fixed amount of ma magnetic flux. Uh, then they're characterized by a, a change in electrostatic potential, I'll call it V. They rotate with an angular velocity omega. So these field lines, you can think about them kinematically just as rotating around like, like a spiral, rotating spiral or something. Uh, so, and that's related to the, the, the flux and the, and the potential. Uh, there's a current that flows along these surfaces. Okay, there's a current that flows along these surfaces. And so not, it's just a function, the enclosed current is just a function of the surface. And there's 
uh, angular momentum that flows along these surfaces, a torque, if you like, that flows along these surfaces, angular momentum flowing along these surfaces, and there's energy that flows along these surfaces. So each surface does its own thing, and it slides past the next surface in an axisymmetric way forever, because that's what you mean by stationary and axisymmetric. So, in, with no, 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 no longitudinal dependence. So this is what this does, and this is sort of this cartoon here. And if you then develop this, if you, this view as the first way of thinking about this, then you find little relations between the torque and the power. And you look something here that looks rather like Ohm's law, IDV. That means the difference in voltage times the current is, is the power. Um, and uh, you can relate it to the, angular, the, the torque times the angular velocity and so on. And you go through all this exercise, and you can make simple models, just actually w work them out by solving equations. The only thing you've got to add to this is, is, sorry, I should say, is how you arrange these flux surfaces depends on a stress balance across them. So you want the, what's push, the, the electromagnetic force that's pushing on one side of a flux surface to be balanced by the one on the other side. So transverse to the surfaces, they're going to wob move around a bit to, so they're in stress balance, but that's all. It doesn't affect the principles that I've just enunciated. And so what you have is, if you look at this thing in the, in the Boyle-Linquist uh, coordinates, uh, Boyle-Linquist frame, which is not rotating with respect to infinity, what you find is that there is power and angular momentum coming out of the black hole. All right? And, um, but if you look at it in the frame of a Zamo frame, which has to be rotating with respect to the surface of the black hole, you see power going into the black hole. So from the point of view of the frame in which the energy and angular momentum are conserved, you are genuinely extracting energy and angular momentum from the black hole. The spin energy is being taken out. And that spin energy, you don't take out all of it. Roughly about half of it is dissipated behind the horizon, increasing the so-called irreducible mass of the black hole, and the rest of it comes out as power. So you can think about this as being an electrical circuit with an internal resistance that's, incre that's dissipating within the black hole, and then a load, which might be some you know, uh, light, light bulb or something like that, that's essentially particle acceleration going on for the gratification of X-ray and radio astronomers and so on, in, and power pushing out the jets and all of that. Okay, so uh, the first time I ever talked, I, I, used, uh, I used to give talks entitled, well, when I was in, first time, I called it How to Get Blood Out of a Stone. Uh, and then when I came to the United States, I, it was politely pointed out to me that, that was not the correct expression. In the United States, you get blood out of a turnip, I think. Is it? And I was told, so I had, uh, it didn't sound quite so good. But at any rate, uh, so, but, the, but the, you know, well, turnip actually does turn, so that's good. Okay, so at any rate, so here's the, here's the general story. Um, and this is a bit of physics I thought I'd better go through. Okay. Um, so what have I got here? Yes. Uh, the, okay. Um, do I want to say this? I, I think this may be... I think I've sort of said what's relevant here. Yes, I've sort of said what's relevant here. And um, there was a point about doing this. It's a little bit technical. So I'm, go I'm going to move on. Um, and so I've already said the efficiency of spin energy extraction is about a half. But that's enough to keep... Uh, the Virgo cluster warm for 10 to the 14 years, so that's all right. Okay, so now, putting magnetic field into the horizon is not enough. You've got to have some means of holding it there, because I've just said that the resistance of the, um, the, 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 the black hole has an internal resistance. That res internal resistance is going to be, uh, when you do the angle averages, and so it's going to be about 100 ohms. So what that means is that if you just had in vacuum as a magnetic field, it's going to go away very fast. Okay, so you've got to actually hold it in place. And the original sort of conceptions, of, well, not the totally original, but well, an early conception of this, that it was held in place by a structure um, by, called an iron torus. Uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, in some sense, the, the essence and the, uh, of the models that most people make for confining jets both within and beyond the EHT configura configuration. And it may well turn out to be right. So I'm not uh, totally convinced that what I, the alternative I'm going to present is correct, but this is at least you have to understand what the, the standard view is before you, you, you sort of poke away at it a bit. 
Okay, so the idea is you get this very thick accretion disk here that is supported by the pressure of hot ions, about 100 MeV ions, mildly relativistic, uh, accompanied by less energetic electrons, maybe about 1 to 10 MeV or thereabouts. And uh, this happens in this, this is from very old, old uh, conference proceedings and so on, uh, and uh, the... the uh, uh, and this happens when the mass supply rate is very, very low, as it is in M87 and Sag star and others. It's not when it's being support, supplied with vast amounts of gas. When you, the idea then, and as is now, but in a much more elaborate way, is things like this happen. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just know. So this is the one I'm focusing on, the low mass supply case, but it has implications for this too, for that matter. I think the first people who, who really got the essential physics pointed were Shapiro et al. in 76, but Japanese researchers also independently and almost contemporaneously got the point, was that what you need to do under these circumstances, that was actually for um, stellar objects rather than AGN, what you needed to do was to keep the electrons cold, otherwise they would radiate like crazy and deflate this torus. So you've got, and you see, worse than that, you'd see them. So, uh, so you've really got to keep these electrons cold and the ions hot. And uh, we'll come back to that point. Okay, so, um, so let's look at this iron torus. As I said, it's got an iron temperature much more than the electron temperature. And, you know, uh, I st uh, you know at the time, I, I, I worked on this with uh, Mitch Bigelman and uh, so Fanny and Martin Rees uh, uh, in, in, the 80, in the 80s a bit, and we, and we were worried at the time about the equilibration. And since then, a lot has been done about the plasma physics of this, and those worries for some people have gone away. I'll just say that I'm still worried. This is an environment that's transrelativistic, trans, uh, transonic, um, uh, transalvanic, and so on, and should have, you know, there's a lot of, lot of modes and a lot of opportunities for heating those electrons, and maybe they can be kept cold, but I, I still worry about that. Uh, others seem not to. So that's okay. Um, uh, but if they do do that, then, of course, you expect to see a much larger X-ray flux from these sources. The Faraday rotation will be a large problem. Uh, uh, but, but the main central point that I want to hinge on here, and I'm going to present it very pejoratively, is that the pressure required, if you take my arithmetic seriously, is enormous. And here, here's, So what I'm going to do is just give you, a, a, um, give, give you um, uh, the, let's just look at the observations from EHT. Let's suppose, and you know, it's a mixed bag here, that there's, a, um, uh, that there's a magnetic field of about a kilogauss. That means at 1.3 millimeters where they observe, the cooling time is about 30 seconds. The synchrotron, synchrotron radius is synchrotron cooling time. So the, the Lorentz factors are you know, about 10 MeV or thereabouts, and it's just about okay for optical, for free free for, for synchrotron self-absorption. But now if you form the following simple sum. And I did, this, is the, this is the exercise I did when I first saw the image. So, you know, I'm just leading you through this. Um, the, um, the millimeter power times the cooling time divided by something like three times the volume of the ring, which has been measured in this imaging, gives you a pressure. Okay, that's just a simple estimate of the pressure. And it's the partial pressure of the emitting electrons, nothing else. And you can then compare that with the magnetic pressure uh, uh, that's in this environment, you know, the kilo associated with kilogauss magnetic field. And that quotient is 10 to the minus 11. So the partial pressure of what you're looking at is tiny compared with the pressures you've got to comply. Now, the simulations which re reproduce this have many, of, they're right, I mean, they're correct. I'm not criticizing them in any way. But they, they look at this in a, they, in a very different way, because, you know, it's a you know, bottom-up sort of calculation. They look in a very different way. They will firstly have a weaker jet, so that kilogauss is an overestimate. If you go through, they, they say, well, in some parts of the paper, but anyway, they say it's a, um, a, um, a, a much weaker jet. So the field goes down. That, that, that's important. Second thing, there's much more pressure there because there's the ions there, there's cooler electrons, and so on. There's also, this is just the partial pressure of the electrons you're looking at, which can be down in the Maxwellian tail, for instance. You know, so that's the, that's this, this, this cooler electrons. Um, so uh, there's a small filling factor. I think in most, one of the things I learned from Ramesh uh, on Monday, which I had not fully appreciated uh, from reading the papers, that in the, in the sort of favored models, 
most of the emission is coming from, this is not their simulation, it's some old hokey one, that, not hokey, it's a very serious one at the time, but it's been superseded now, but it's one I'm familiar with, um, uh, would come from the, um, uh, from the surface, from the interface between the, the torus and the, and, and the jet. Okay? So, uh, so, so it really is a small filling factor that's doing most of the emission. So you know, the models all make sense. I'm not criticizing, but I, I w all I would say is that this at least this argument, in detail surely wrong, at least motivates one to think about alternatives. That's, all I, that's the only statement I would make. And in particular, I, as I said this yesterday, it obviously motivates looking at orbiting VLBI. So here's a cartoon which I'm going to show three times that has got the essence of, of you know, the story that I'm trying to, uh, to tell you. Um, firstly, here's the black hole itself. It's spinning, probably pretty rapidly, but it doesn't have to be. Here's the ergosphere within which physical observers, magnetic field, everything you care to mention, has to rotate with respect to the distant stars. And so, the, so everything rotates within this ergosphere. Here are magnetic field lines shown sort of schematically, no more as a cartoon. And the claim is that in this region, and in, in the whole region at least, that was observed by EHT, it's not gas you're looking at, but essentially a magnetosphere. Okay, it's a magnetosphere that you're looking at, not orbiting gas. And it's ma highly magnetically dominated, just like, you know, the Earth's magnet, you know, the pulsar magnetosphere and the Earth's magnetic sphere or whatever. And so I'll, 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 I'll say I'll show this sort of several times, uh, this cartoon, he's got the whole sort of picture there. And the gas which has to be there, I mean, one of the ways I like to say this, I, um, it, you know, if you think of the oldest cosmology, um, one of the oldest cosmologies, which has a flat Earth resting on the backs of turtles, um, and you say, what are those turtles standing on? That's more turtles. Um, so it's turtles all the yeah, But then ultimately, the turtles, I think you have to stand on something. It's the same with the magnetic field. Magnetic field combines magnetic But ultimately, there has to be gas there. There has to be a ring of gas at large radius. Now, it might just be at a few gravitational radii as shown schematically here, or it might be in the next building. Um, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of what I'm going to say, and there may be a range of uh, answers to where is the gas. I'll come back to that point. But at any rate, there's some region here which I'll call a magnetic clutch. There's the magneto ergomagnetosphere here, which is what I'll talk about first. Then there's this sort of region be in between, which I'll call the magnetic clutch, uh, which takes essentially uh, energy and angular momentum from there, and gives it to the disk, and then beyond this is a hydromagnetic wind that is collimating and confining the, the jets that you observe using VLBI and X-ray astronomy and all the rest of it, ultimately. So, uh, and, uh, okay, let's move on then. So here's this sort of ergo magnetosphere. I'm sorry, I, these are all sort of hokey cartoons rather than uh, simulations, but um, that's all I can do. Um, and, uh, if you regard this, firstly, as a strictly poloidal field, a strictly uh, force-free field, you know, stationary and perfect and so on, then there's a little bit, then there's a bit of a problem here, because if we considered, say, a field line like this, going out like that, it will carry, it must, it has to rotate, because it passes through the ergosphere, it has to rotate. It has to carry away energy and angular momentum. Okay, you know, at large radius, it, uh, you know, right up there, it's going to be carrying away energy and angular momentum. And yet, if it's just going through the ergosphere, and I'm saying I've not got any gas here, then there's no source of that energy and angular momentum as I posed, posed the issue. So what will happen is, if I, as I pose that issue, the field line will be dragged back to its minimum angular velocity, some radiation reaction will set in, and so on. Now, my contention is, and this is, a, I could say, a conjecture at best, it's a conjecture. I've done my best to sort of do little toy problems and so on to, reassure, you know, to encourage myself, but I haven't been able to do a proper simulation, and I'm hoping one day one will happen. Um, uh, my conjecture is that, in fact, it's not like that. Instead, these magnetic surfaces, as I've sketched them here, are not stationary and axis symmetric, completely independent, sliding past each other, any more than a ring of gas in an accretion disk has pays no attention to the next ring of gas, Instead, there's a coupling between them. There are instabilities. There are local instabilities that develop. And those local instabilities transport energy and angular momentum, not just along these flux 
surfaces like that, but across them. And that is strong and virulent and, ve and very powerful. So the flow of energy and angular momentum is not just up, it's out. And so there's a strong coupling between one magnetic surface and the next, and the whole thing's wibbling and wobbling around with sort of instabilities. Locally are the easiest things to analyze, as far as I'm concerned, but globally is, is, is probably a large part of the story, if this is, has any sense to it at all. So, so this is the idea that you uh, uh, have these, this, uh, and then you can say, well, you've just got these magnetic field lines. What, what is, what was EHD looking at? I'm not, you're not allowing any gas there. What was EHD actually looking at? Well, of course, it's looking at synchrotron radiation. But my guess is that probably the right, a better way to characterize this, rather than the big ring of, of hot ions accompanied by cooler electrons, is instead as a current sheet. Of course, it's the electrons that the emitting particles, but like in a pulsar, you're actually looking at the current sheet. So, uh, so the two things that, that I want you to get from this bit of physics, if you like, is firstly that the magnetic field uh, is forced to rotate in the black hole horizon and also especially in the ergosphere with respect to the distant um, frames, but also that energy and angular momentum, the conjecture is that these are transported out as well as up through, from these surfaces. Okay? It's just like an accretion disk. It, things go out as well. I'll come back to that point. Okay. So there are actually some other... Uh, the one I sketched there was the simplest one. There are some configurations that one can think about that I suspect are not what happens, but just for the record, I'll say this. The one I would only just draw attention to is something like this, where you make something that looks a little bit more like a, a regular magnetosphere. And the reason why I say this is you could be looking for something like a nine-day period in M87 that will correspond to looking for pulses, you know, like in a pulsar. So, I'm, you know, as it wobbles around, you should be looking for quasi-periods like that, maybe. I don't know, uh, but, but my guess is that they're the probably more reasonable configurations than the one I sketched on the, last, on the last view graph. But at any rate, but this is sort of interesting, um, I think, in other contexts. Okay, uh, and, you know, the way you sort of sort, you know, all this, I think, is, is imminently sort outable by observation, you know, and, uh, and it may already have been so, I don't know, but, uh, but I'm not quite sure what, you know, the details of this electromagnetic uh, transfer are. Okay. So um, I, I, I won't belabor this point. I just want, just want to say what one thing um, I think. Uh, uh, so you know, if you say, you know, and a lot of effort has gone um, into um, tracing rays through the Kerr metric, and a lot of you know, a lot of excitement has been about seeing you know a photon ring or something like that, where you might be getting a significant amount of power. Um, uh, from rays that if you go in the scholastically correct way, if you can go back from one's eyes to the source, um, if you follow those rays backwards, then you, uh, then they, there are, there's a set of rays that make one, two, and the orbits, and, you know, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I think it's true that every black hole in the universe uh, absorbs, uh, 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 images every source in the universe an infinite number of times, but it's not a useful uh, thing to say because the amount of flux that's associated with all of those images is nothing and uh, it's really the big images and so you know it, it isn't so obvious at least to me that you get a well-defined ring because it what it really depends on is what's on the end of those rays and what you're actually looking at if you're looking at some rather diffuse source through this then it's rather different than looking at some distant point source for example it's a very different different story so I won't make any more about this but it's this is all fairly, this sort of, if you believe in the Kerr metric, this sort of relativity is all, all, all fairly straightforward and it's not controversial or anything and there's lots, lots of fine codes that have been written to do all this and it, and it doesn't take much computer time, whatever. But it, the, the real challenge is to know what you're actually looking at rather than do the, the geometric optics. Okay, so let's take, show this again and now let's talk about the magnetic clutch and then I've just shown schematically here in this uh, cartoon, uh, got a nice cartoon made by my collaborator, uh, uh, and you can get field lines, you can just show schematically that are tangled there, there are going to be instabilities that will develop, and that's the sort of way you go from one magnetic flux surface to the next, transport energy and angular momentum. Um, my claim is that this is just a little small perturbation, it's really a big flow of energy and angular momentum in these environments, rather than and these field lines have got to rotate essentially uh, close to the speed of light, and these ones are traveling, uh, are, are rotating much more slowly. And so there's a, dip, there's a, a, a velocity gradient there, and that's important for the instability, the angular velocity gradient for that instability. So that's, that was the point of making that, 
point there. And so you've got this sort of schematic thing here. And so in this magnetic clutch here, if we think about this magnetic clutch, we're getting energy and angular momentum going outwards. And, <coughs> you know, um, uh, and ultimately, of course, it's got to be confined by the gas where the inertia becomes more important than, than the pressures you've got. So there's probably a lot of gas here. But it's also, and I, uh, at this point we'll come back in it again, um, is um, there's, there's going to be a wind here too. And insofar as this wind is uh, subalphanic, as it will be initially, that is a surface which is also confining this magnetic field. It isn't just having a, an equatorial ring that's doing this. You've got an outflow going to large latitudes. And that is also confining this magnetic field in this surface, in this region. So there's a, 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 a claim that in practice you um, hold back you know, in a King Canute sort of way, you hold the in, call, in falling gas out of falling into the black hole. You just hold it back, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll say in a moment what I think actually happens to it, and it doesn't fall all the way in towards the black hole and make a giant torus here, um, but instead there's this, 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 this magnetic clutch, if you like, in between. And you can make various models of this. Uh, you can make sort of force-free models, which you know, adapt ones that have you know, been around for a while, uh, that have the magnetic field in the center significantly larger than the magnetic field here because they're force-free dynamical regions transporting energy and angular momentum. And so a typical scaling is one where you've got a current going up the center here, and the toroidal field will then go as inversely as a cylindrical radius, and that is more or less communicated, in essence, to the poloidal field uh, that goes to the disk like that. So again, I'm not, not coming over too strong on this because I do not claim that I understand that, let alone believe it. Um, and actually, the other way around. Um, but uh, but. Um, uh, but uh, it is, I think, uh, quite accessible to simulation. I'm, I'm hoping that one of my collaborators will actually do this. Uh, and uh, the one thing I can guarantee, I really do strongly believe, is that we will learn an awful lot from these exercises about something. OK, all right, so, so that's, that's the, I guess, the point. And you know, what determines this radius of the disk here, the inner radius of the disk, depends on history and uh, a lot of other factors, which I can't sort of tell you much about at the moment. So um, now I want to take a segue again into a second sort of physics detour, but one that, that's kind of important for understanding what, what's at stake here. Let's just make a very simple picture of, of the earliest type of accretion disk, sort of made famous by Shakur and Sanyai, but in fact, sometimes this, this was sort of understood by earlier authors too. Um, you have a thin disk that has a slow, steady inflow with a certain mass per unit radius mu. And there's a torque associated with it. Don't need to know what it is. We believe it's the magneto-rotational instability on steroids, but it isn't. Um, it don't, that doesn't matter for these purposes. There's an angular velocity, and uh, I tried about this stuff. Um, uh, okay, uh, then there's an equation of continuity, equation of angular momentum, and equation of energy. And in this disk, it's presumed that you radiate away all the dissipated energy. It comes off in ultraviolet or, or infrared photons or whatever. And, uh, and so if you do that, what you find is the energy between two neighboring uh, radii, two neighboring circles, if you like, in this thin disk um, that's liberated is three times the release of binding energy. This is the thing one teaches in class nowadays or has done for a long time. And the, where does that, where does the two thirds that you didn't think of, first of all, come from? It's the energy that's transported outward by the torque in the disk. It does work at a rate g times omega. The torque times the angular velocity, that does work on the next ring. And the, and the divergence in that energy flux is the other two thirds. And that's important. There's a lot of energy there. And, uh, and that's why you know, multiple accretion disks are a little bit brighter than you might expect them to be on this basis. And the ultimate source of that energy, of course, is what's going on at small radius where this is no longer true, and energy is conserved. The books, the books are balanced eventually, but this is, this is what one gets. OK, okay. so that's this. Now, if we consider the case when you've got a disk that cannot radiate away that energy, it's, it doesn't have the wherewithal to do it, then it has to get rid of it. And this is an idea that Mitch Bugelman and I uh, it, it, it developed. I don't think it was terribly original, but... I, it, 
I think the way we did it probably was a bit different, but uh, it's, we called it an adios. It doesn't really mean, matter what that means. And it was dealing with a case where, in principle, you cannot radiate away that energy. Then you have to do the next best thing. You have to carry it off in some sort of wind. And that wind, most reasonably, is a hydromagnetic wind that carries away energy and angular momentum in the appropriate ratio. And under those circumstances, you'll unbind, you'll unbind enough of the gas to carry it away. So I'm saying that if you do not radiate, it's quite natural to carry, it, carry away the excess energy via wind. OK, so that, that's the sort of physics points that I wanted to make as a sort of generic points without going into any details of detailed simulations of this. So let's go to the third time I show this cartoon and the third component, which in the title is what I would now call an, an ejection disk. This is another, la you know, like, like an accretion disk, it's another Latin construct. You know, Caesar throwing his army a thousand paces and all of that. And so you've got a, uh, the wind is seen, the disk, sorry, is seen as a structure from which essentially all of the gas is ejected in this limit. Now, do I think that all quasars are like this? Just let me say, I could, I could tell you a story along those lines, but could I keep a straight face? No, um, I, I, I couldn't. Um, but I, I mean, I could tell you a story, but it wouldn't be a totally convincing one. But so we're talking about the low mass supply case primarily here, you know, the M87s of this world and so on. So, so here we've got a wind, and it's carrying away all of the energy and angular momentum in this disk, and the gas is simply not going in. Now, plasma is slippery. Plasma will find its way in, but the contention is but not so much of it, and most of it is blown away, and it's not, most of it is not forming a continuous flow into the black hole. Most of it is going away. So this is, this is the story. And uh, so how does this happen? What we've got is gas here with essentially just its own rest mass, and yet it's being ejected to infinity with large energy. The energy and the angular momentum associated with this wind comes not from the release of gravitational energy, but from the spin of the hole. And it is communicated outwards by these um, instabilities, these connections between the magnetic surfaces that send energy and angular momentum, as shown schematically here, outwards, not just to a disk as shown as a cartoon here, but also to this wind, which is coupled to the disk insofar as it's subarphanic. Okay, so, so we've got this spinny, spinner in the middle that's essentially coupled to a disk at large radius. I haven't said how much, I'm not sure about that. And then that drives away all the energy and the angular momentum from that disk. And then it, it's a highly, almost certainly a highly magnetized wind, and that, in these circumstances, is, is collimating the jets that are powered, also powered, by the spin of the black hole. So it's not an accretion disk, because the power isn't coming from accretion. The, the gas is almost incidental. It's certainly there at large radius. We see it with Hubble in M87. We see it orbiting the right way, and so on. So it's for, uh, there, but the contention is that within the middle, it's going, it's go, it's going to be lost. OK, so, um, and so it's all going to be flung out. Now, some, obviously, some of it will get in. I mean, in, in the real world, some of it will get in. But the claim is it's dynamically of minor importance. So we've got this here. And this disk will go out to very large radius, because that depends on the supply of gas and so on. And so the wind that's collimating the jet essentially emanates from this disk and all the gas that's you know, incorporated into the boundary layers of the jets that you observe with these larger scale uh, observations uh, is, comes essentially from the ejection disk. So, and, and the key point is that the, the torque here does work at a rate g omega, which sends the energy outwards through the disk, from, from, through the clutch, through the disk, and then out into a wind. So it's a different view from the sort of standard view that, you know, I know there's a talk for, for years and years and years. OK, so that, that's it. And so what we're turning out is that. So now at this point, I have to know which day of the week we're on and where. We, what, how much longer should I talk? I've gone a little bit more slowly. Two or three minutes. So I've now got um, uh, uh, three quarters of the talk to give. OK. Um, <laughs> So in those two or three minutes, you're going to see the talk as if through a passing railway carriage. <laughs> OK, so what I'll just do is lay down. Um, 
what it is. And if someone were to ask me later about some of this, I would, I would explain. Okay, so here are a series of other things that make that look mild by comparison for those who work in the subject. Okay, well, I've just said mild by comparison. Okay, so uh, flat spectrum radio quasars, 3C279, um, uh, is the, is the root poster case. This varies in three minutes in the frame of the source. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a huge source of soft photons which will absorb gamma rays. If you look on the bank note, it says in QED we trust, I certainly trust them that more than I trust in the theories of turbulence. And, um, uh, and so the way that you get gamma rays out from this small region here is by having a sheath of gas connected to the story I've just told you that absorbs all the soft photons. So when you look down the jet, you can see gamma rays from small radius. Okay, another part of this, which I won't have time to say, is that the broad emission lines, clouds that you see in quasars, that's the thing that, you, that characterizes them, essentially derived from this outflow, in the case of quasars rather than the M87s, where you don't see them, but nonetheless it's the same story. All of this is matter that's flung out, so the clouds are mainly that. The low power jets, okay, here I showed this before, this is 3C84. Here the story is that the, the boundary layer that is responsible for this structure here, and, you, and what they said and they wrote this paper here, look, they say that the, the jet comes from the disk, not the hole, because this, you know, we're seeing this thing coming from a large radius, not a small radius. I would say this is the R, R disk in my old cartoon that really is a magnetic clutch between those two, I suppose, if I were taking this, try, trying to take this terribly seriously. Okay. And polarization is obviously critical. So, oh, this is, these are Reinhard Genzel's observations, and et al, I should say et al, with gravity and so on, of 3C273. Um, again, that's related to the, the story about the kinematics of these broad emission line uh, clouds. Um, the gamma ray synchrotron, this is, some people here know about this. There's a standard model of laser, spectroscopic, it's what I call the Bactrian model. Um, it is uh, two-humped, like that. So, um, and the standard view that has been there since a long time uh, is that that is synchrotron radiation, that is inverse Compton radiation. I w there's a real problem with that if these jets are strongly magnetized. It's really hard to make this inverse Compton. So I think they're both synchrotron. They're both, these are, that's synchrotron, that's synchrotron. The gamma rays, at least the variable part of them, are synchrotron radiation. And what happens is, basically, most importantly, the beta Heitler process, where you're accelerating protons that come from the outside to enormous energies, 100 peta, peta volts or 100 peta electron volts or more, and those then create pairs with enormous energy in the soft photon field to which they're exposed. So it's the Coulomb field of the, of the, of the energetic proton making electron-positron pairs electromagnetically and therefore highly efficiently, and these enormously energy, energetic electrons um, po and the po positrons drop like a stone in energy space and radiate through synchrotron radiation, the gamma rays that you see. So this is it's still just synchrotron radiation. It's not complete, it is still a classical process, but it's done, uh, and so the variable part, at least, and probably much of this, is actually synchrotron radiation, not Compton. So that's the story there. Um, the, uh, another part of the black hole story is, that's is sort of more general than this, is what is the, um, you know, the, 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 the types of black hole, uh, types of jet that you get. There's a classification, which I probably everyone knows, the fanoroff riley classification. They were my uh, friends and colleagues when I was a student, and they wrote this paper, which seemed rather speculative on not much data, and I wasn't sure it would last very long. Well, all that's happened is it's got more and more important and more and more powerful and more and more convincing as the years have rolled over. <laughs> and uh, it isn't just a tentative thing, it's, it's, it's real classification. And so the interpretation of this is that, um, is that in the FR1s, uh, what happens is the jet does not make it out of a, a sphere of influence, which is essentially the Bondi radius, GM over sigma squared, something like that. Uh, it, could you, you, you can't get as far as that. So you just make some sort of buoyant plume, which looks like that. But in a powerful source, you can do that. You can get through this radius. And if you can get through the Bondi radius, you're home free. You have a relativistic supersonic jet going all the way out into the lobes of Cygnus A and it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that story uh, The going on. Um, why are the a majority of radio quiet objects, not silent, but quiet, and a minority of radio loud objects? Here the contention is, and it relates back to a little bit to what I said, um, is that the, basically, if you look at this sphere of influence or somewhere around that, 
The radio loud objects are by and large associated with elliptical galaxies, which have quasi-spherical accretion at all latitudes, and they essentially have gas barreling in at high latitudes as well as low latitudes, and that makes it easier to confine and concentrate magnetic flux in the central regions. That's the contention. This is a contention that's not borne out by any simulation or anything like that, just a thought. Um, whereas, by contrast, in the this type objects associated with spirals and so on that are radio quiet, you have the gas coming just at low latitude, and it's much easier for the magnetic field to escape radially outwards, as you show here. And, uh, and you can make several simple models of this. I, I won't, won't burden that. Uh, so that's another, another thought um, uh, that sort of, if you like, inspired by this. So if I, um, and, and again, mass supply, um, you know, one of my colleagues said, I've been working on accretion all my life, and all I've ever seen is stuff go out. Um, so, um, uh, so um, uh, you know, it's sort of half true. So it's a great challenge, I think, to observational astronomy to see accreting gap in AGN. Okay, so here's my summary. Um, uh, uh, these are the things I sort of talk more about. This is the stuff that I just sort of introduced, if you like, um, and maybe that's as much as it needs. Uh, in the end, down here, uh, going back to the religious uh, uh, way that I started this, uh, this is, uh, I've only got nine theses here. Uh, Martin Luther had 95 of them. There they are, if you care to know them. And, uh, um, uh, and I hope it doesn't cause as much trouble. And, but, okay, all right, thank you very much indeed. Yes, sorry. I think you've brought up a very important point, Richard. Um, uh, and, and let me give you two different an two answers relating to different, different aspects of that. One is just in the specific case of M87, uh, Holland Ford and others were able to observe it. It was early Hubble observations, the gas orbiting in the same sense as it now appears morphologically. The spin is orbiting in M87. So that, in that one case, it looks like they're going around the same way. Uh, the other thing is a slightly more insidious thing, and I've sort of said, um, you know, black holes are, you know, are spinning very rapidly and so on. Um, if you take the view that whatever is going into a black hole to grow its mass, be it gas, be it stars, be it other black holes, be it copies of the National Geographic, it doesn't really matter what it is, and you assume that it's supplied isotropically, then then the, the retrograde, the half of them that are on retrograde orbits will slow down the black hole more because they're captured from larger radii than the half that are on prograde orbits. Okay, I think that's a generic statement. So there's a natural tendency, all things being equal, to slow down black holes. So they slow down in, in spin faster than they grow in mass. In relative, in relative. So that, I think, is an important point. Now, it could be that you know, everything in a galaxy is all rotating the same way, and I suppose for this story to be true, you basically want things, to, they want it to be locally a common angular momentum direction. But it is something important to worry about. So thank you for bringing up that, that important point. Yes. Oh, it's, accre it's accreted. It's falling in. In the case of an elliptic... Oh, that, well, that, happens, that must happen beyond a million M. And so it, it was actually on the extension of that view graph over in MIT. Uh, but, um, but it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's way, way away. And, and in the case of M87, I think most of the mass supply is coming from the cluster. And so that's falling in. In, the, in case of other objects, they may be coming from, you know, isolated ellipticals. It will be coming from the outer parts of the elliptical. But that gas is falling in, and, you know, it only really becomes an accretion disk at about, you know, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th m, when, you know, the, the orbital velocity is comparable with the uh, velocity dispersion of stars and so on in the center of the galaxy. Okay, so, 
No, there was a disk there. But that was an injection disk. Yeah, and, and no, but, but what's happening is, well, uh, let, let, let's get some number, numbers from M87. Maybe, you know, uh, you, um, it, it, it might be a, a solar mass a year, just, to, you know, at, at, a, at, a million, uh, at a million M. Say 10 solar, um, 10 solar masses a year at a million M. It's one solar mass a year at, um, at 10 to the fourth M. And, um, and, uh, 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 and then it's essentially all gone away by um, 100 M. That's just, just, just round numbers. I'm not tied to that, but as an example. So you slowly lose the mass from each, ra each successive radius in the wind as you go out. Because you're ca you know, there's a source of energy and angular momentum transported outwards at small radius, which is n no, not normally a feature of accretion disk models, but that's what's different here. And it obviously leaves with speeds that are much larger than they would, you know, it has no, no speed at, at large radius. So it's got to get that energy from somewhere. So it's necessary to, this is, a, this is necessary, this, to do this. Yeah. Point number eight. Yes. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, uh, there's an annual review article um, uh, that Dave Meyer, Tony Reedhead, and I wrote uh, that actually goes into a sort of review of this uh, a bit more. But basically, the point is that is a natural place to have things like recollimation shocks forming inside the jet. Um, to have uh, dynamical, you know, it shows up in simulations rather a lot, to have a change in the focusing which causes the sort of things that happen in stuff going out of the back end, backsides of jet engines and so on. Um, uh, so that's, that is a natural dynamical place to do the most damage to a jet. And the contention is if you can get through that radius, you're home free going out into the intergalactic medium. And so that's really the sort of the FR1, FR2 switch. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah, hi. Is this your last day here? No, I'm here tomorrow, and then I leave at 6 a.m. on Monday. On, uh, oh, yes. Yes, yes, there we go, yes. Yes, 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 y